I just want to tell you that um, I only had like two or three people tell me about these. I was curious how many people would, you know, somehow these ended up on my back. The youth did tell me. You know how many adults told me? Like two or three. I, I think it's become such an expectation that y'all are going to do something to me. <laughs> you bow with me one more time. Father, we come at this time to, to bring a message. I pray for your spirit to be in the midst of it, that though it will be my voice, that the message would be yours and that it would land in the place for each of us, including me, that it needs to, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know what this is? It's origami. Origami, yeah, it's a quail. A quail, remember, you know what that pertains to? It's, it's, it's little. Yeah. Our pragmatic realist in the back. Yes, it's not quite full size. We told you it's a giraffe. It's a, not. It's a quail. It's a it can be a giraffe to you, but it's not. I have not seen a giraffe that quite had wings like that. But. So remember the story about Moses and the million and five quail. So get ready because... Um, 412 Youth is making quail for you, and at some point, you're just going to get quailed. <laughs> We're continuing our series from Mark Batterson. It's a Mark Batterson sermon series and a book called The Circle Maker. And this week, we are going to transition into uh, the topic of persistence. The title of this message is Pray Hard, Persistent Quotient. And so I want to start with just a few um, stories for um, for, for that, or a few, some research is what it, well, that's what it is. <laughs> so, in standardized math tests, some Japanese kids were uh, found to score higher than American children do, and we tend to think that that proclivity, that, te that innate ability uh, is what would drive that, right? Because you'd be good at math is why that would happen. But researchers took a look and they discovered something a little bit different from that. What they found is that it just might have more to do with effort than with ability. So what, how they figured that out was that they had some first graders and they gave them this test. And it was a difficult puzzle to solve. But they didn't really care if they solved it. But they wanted to see how long they would keep at it before they quit. So they did that and the American children lasted on average 9.47 minutes. Now I don't know exactly how many .47 is, but it's about nine and a half minutes, right? And then the Japanese kids lasted uh, on an average 13.93. And again, I don't know what 0.93 is, but it's almost 14 minutes, right? So that turned out that the Japanese children stuck to it about 47% longer than the American kids did. Researchers concluded that the difference in math scores might have less to do with intelligence quotient, less to do with IQ than it has to do with persistence quotient, PQ. Are you going to stick it out? Are you going to keep trying? The Japanese first graders simply tried harder, and that's what happened for them. And that study not only explains the difference in some standardized math scores, the implications are true no matter where you turn. See, it doesn't matter whether it's athletics or academics or music or math. There are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. There's no substitutes. Success is a derivative of persistence. Another study, Anders Ericsson at the Berlin Academy of Music, he did a study with musicians. And with the help of his professors, he divided the violinists into three groups. The first was world-class soloists, the, the elite violinists in the school. The others were good violinists. They could play professionally. And then the third group were those who were not good enough to be professional. They were kind of those who would play at home. And all of them started playing at roughly the same age. And they practiced about the same amount of time until they reached the age of eight. And that's when their practice habits diverged. That's when their practice changed for each of them. The researchers found that by the age of 20, the average players, those who were not going to be professional, had logged about 4,000 hours of practice time. The next group, the good violinists, totaled about 8,000 hours. These are guys that could play in a band and play in a group. But the elite players, the elite performers, set the standard at 10,000 hours of practice. 10, thousand hours. And there's no denying that innate ability, that talent quotient is there, that that's important. But if you want to reach that potential, then you have to practice. It takes persistent effort. I think that if you talk to the musicians in the band, they'll tell you 
that why how do you get good? How do you get good, Eric? You practice. You keep playing. It annoys, I'm sure, the, the heck out of his parents when he's playing at night, but, but that's all right. <laughs> Persistence. Persistence. Stick to stick stick to itiveness. Persistence is the magic bullet. It seems like ten thousand is kind of the magic number. Now, this is the last of these. Daniel Levitin is a neurologist, and he said that, he said this. He said the emerging picture from such studies is that 10,000 hours of practice is required to achieve a level of mastery associated with being a world-class expert in anything. In study after study of composers, basketball players, fiction writers, ice skaters, concert pianists, chess players, master criminals, and what have you, this number comes up again and again. No one has yet, and this is up here, that no one has yet found a case in which true world-class expertise was accomplished in less time. It seems that it takes the brain that long to assimilate all that it needs to know to achieve true mastery. 10,000 hours. So let me ask you this, is prayer any different? Is prayer any different? It's a habit to be cultivated, right? It's a discipline to be developed. It's a skill to be practiced. Now, I certainly don't want to reduce praying time to kind of a checklist thing. And I go, oh, I got, got, my, got my 15, 20 minutes of prayer. That's not the deal. But it's going to take some time and persistence and effort to become the prayer that you hopefully desire to be. And I know this for sure. The bigger the dream, and we have some big dreams around here, the harder you have to pray. The bigger the dream, the harder you're going to have to pray. Think in terms of something that we talk about, because I know that there's a couple of folks here who have run a marathon. If you want to complete a marathon, you just want to finish a marathon, you have to do some training. Amen? Amen. If you want to finish well, what do you have to do? More training. You have to put in more and more effort. If you want to be world class, a world class marathon runner, one of those guys who does, does two hour marathons, it becomes your life. Right? You have to devote training, nutrition, everything that you do is revolving around becoming a world class, becoming elite. What if? What if we took that attitude into our prayer life? What if our goal was to become world class prayer? What if that was what we wanted to do? What if we put the effort into that? What if that was what Jonathan Brown, I'm going to grow up and be a world-class prayer, right? Jonathan doesn't like being put on the spot, I'm just saying. <laughs> but that's, it'll take some effort, right, to become that kind of a prayer. We have an example, and then this is from, from Jesus. This is out of Luke chapter 18. Jesus was telling his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. So he said this. He said, there was a judge in a certain city who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow, widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while. But finally, he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me slap crazy. Yeah, slap's not in there. But she's driving me crazy, right? This woman is annoying me. She's, you know what? I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant appeals. And the parable of the persistent widow shows us what praying hard looks like. Shows us what praying hard looks like. Knocking until your knuckles are raw. You keep knocking at right. Knock on the door. Knock until your knuckles are raw. Cry out until your voice is lost. Plead until your tears run dry. Praying hard is praying through. Praying hard is praying through. It's not just praying for. Praying for is fine. But praying hard is praying through. It's praying beyond. It's praying to the next step. It's more than words. It's blood, sweat, and tears. Praying hard is two-dimensional. It's praying like it depends on God because you know what? It does. It does. But it's also working like it depends on you because you know what? It does. So we want to pray like it depends on God. Waiting for the amen. 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 Working like it depends on you. 
Amen. That's right. So it's both of those. It's a two-dimensional kind of thing. So we want to do this. We want to do that. It's praying until God answers, no matter how long it takes. It's doing whatever it takes to show God you're serious. I'm serious about this. It's the widow keeps coming to the judge. The judge doesn't care about God or care about people. He goes, she's bugging me. I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to answer this. I'm going to work on this. Desperate times call for desperate measures. There comes a moment when you need to throw caution to the wind, when you need to draw a circle in the sand. There comes a moment when you need to defy protocol, drop to your knees, and pray for the impossible. Lord, I know that I can't do it, but I know that you're a big God, and I know that you can. I need you to show up. I need you to show out. For I know the plans I have for you. I'll give you a hope and a future. It's a promise. Grab a promise from God and pray it. Pray it. You can be audacious and tenacious and go for it when you're talking about praying into the promises of God. There comes a moment when we've got to muster every ounce of faith and call down rain from heaven. For the persistent widow, this was that moment, right? We don't know what the injustice was. We don't know what had happened. But she was going to the judge and she was going to keep going to the judge until he gave her an answer. So she did. That's what made her a circle maker. She drew that circle. She stayed in there. And the judge knew that she was never going to give up. The judge knew it. She knew that he was, she was going to keep circling his house. She was, going to, he was, she was going to keep showing up and annoying him until he gave her an answer. He, she wanted justice. And she was going to keep doing this until the day she died if she didn't get justice. The judge knew that there was no quit in the persistent widow. The judge knew there was no quit in the persistent widow. So let me ask you this. Does the judge know that about you? That there's no quit in you. That I'm going to keep claiming the promises of God. And I'm going to grab hold of them. And I'm going to pray into them. And I'm going to latch on to them. How desperate are you for a miracle? Desperate enough to pray through the night? How many times are you willing to circle the promise? Jericho was only 13 times. It might take more than that. willing to go until the day you die? How long will you knock on the door of opportunity? You're going to knock until you knock the door down. You're going to keep praying, keep going. And I want to talk about desperation as a gift because it, if you aren't desperate, you won't take desperate measures. And if you don't pray like it depends on God, the biggest miracles and best promises will remain out of your prayer reach. But if you learn how to pray hard, pray through like the persistent widow, God will honor your bold prayers because bold prayers honor God. When I got sober in 1990, I didn't, it wasn't like this. It wasn't like, you know, hey, I'm walking down the street. And, you know, things are going really good for me. My life is perfect and uh, things are just right. I think I'll go to treatment. That was, <laughs> that wasn't it. <laughs> You know, things weren't going good. I, I was not, things were not good in my life. I was engaged to be married. I broke up with, with her in a blackout, which is when you drink so much you don't remember what you did or said. She wouldn't talk to me for three days. And when she finally did, she told me some of the things that I said, and it was bad. I had been verbally horrible to her. I lost that relationship, which cost me a six-month-old boy who was not mine, but he had, I'd been with her since he was born. So, in effect, he was. So that moment caused me to examine my life and realize that my life was a huge mess. It was such a huge mess that I was questioning whether to keep on living again. I attempted suicide at 25, but promised never to do that again. But I was back at 29 in that same shape. I was, in a word, desperate. Desperate. And that desperation led me to treatment, treatment led me to recovery, recovery led me to new life, new life led me to a new understanding of a God of grace and not of pure judgment, not a God with a lightning bolt waiting to zing me for everything that I did wrong. Grace led me to a new career that led me to another new career that led me here. Now that is the briefest version <laughs> of an impossible journey that started because of the gift of desperation. I got desperate. I became willing to do whatever it took to get help. Amen. It was not the most orthodox of journeys, 
But God doesn't mind that either because God does not mind the unorthodox. Man, hallelujah, that ought to get him. <laughs> Amen out of everybody. The persistent widow's methodology was unorthodox, right? She's she's going, she could have, should have waited. I got a court date, got to wait for the court date. Don't go bug the judge at home. How many of y'all have bugged the judge at home? Yeah, no, we don't go to bug the judge at home. She went bug, bug the judge at home. She's going to the residence. She's crossing the professional line. But here's the thing. That reveals something about the nature of God, right? God is not nearly as concerned with protocol as we might think he is. Hear this. If, that, if he was concerned with protocol, you know who he would have chosen as his disciples? The Pharisees. If it was about protocol, you know who he chose? You and me. Fishermen, tax collectors, insurance guys. <laughs> GBI agents. That's who he chose, right? That's it. He went, he did, if it was protocol, that he would not have chosen him. It isn't who Jesus honored. You know who Jesus honored? Jesus, Jesus went to the house of a Pharisee, and the common protocol would have been that that Pharisee would have washed his feet and, and, and greeted him and all that. Didn't do it. You know who did wash his feet? A prostitute came in and washed his feet with her tears, dried him with her hair. Jesus honored her. Jesus honored the tax collector, we little Zacchaeus, right? He climbs up in a tree so that because he's too small and the guys don't like him. I imagine he was probably walking up trying to see Jesus, and they're like, I ain't letting him see, you know. <laughs> so he had to climb up in a tree just to see Jesus. Jesus goes to his house and changes his whole world. That's who Jesus went to. The tax collector that the people didn't even like. He honored, and this is one of my favorite stories in scripture. So there were these these four friends and they had a sick friend a fifth and so so they go to somebody's house and jesus is there and and it's packed there's a crowd jesus attracted crowds and but their friend they wanted to get him to beat jesus so jesus could heal him so you know what they did they went to the house they climbed up on top of the house think about this climbed up think about it here what it would be like is we'd be in here and then all of a sudden some of this stuff would start falling down because it's coming down because they're going to lower him into the sanctuary so because jesus is here and they can't get in so they cut a hole in the roof of somebody's house that they didn't know so that they could set him down in there so jesus could heal him and you know what jesus did he healed him jesus honored that effort jesus honored the woman who drove a judge crazy because she wouldn't stop knocking. The common denominator in each of these stories is holy desperation. Desperation. It's not something to be avoided. It's something to be grabbed hold of. People took desperate measures to get to God. God honored them for it. And nothing has changed. God's still honoring spiritual desperados. And I know some of y'all. I know some of y'all in here are spiritual desperados. <laughs> you know, be that. Live into that. So be a spiritual desperado who crashes a party. Be a spiritual desperado who climbs a tree. God's still honoring those who defy protocol with their bold prayers. With their audacity. How dare you? I dare because God promised it and I'm going to stand on his promise and I'm going to keep praying until he, until he answers this prayer. Be tenacious, be audacious. If you're praying into the promises of God, man, grab them and hang on because he is a good God and God is for you. The persistent widow is kind of the gold standard, right? You read this story and you go, isn't that annoying? Why is that even in the Bible? That's not very nice. That doesn't, that doesn't fit with a nice Jesus. I got news for you. Jesus wasn't always nice. <laughs> He turned the table over every once in a while. He called people vipers and stuff. <laughs> but her unrelenting persistence was the only difference between justice and injustice. And that persistence, by the way, is modeled by the Holy Spirit. You know, the, the Holy Spirit is interceding for you right now. When we don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit prays for us with groans and and. and words that we don't even know about. It happens. It happens. Been doing that for your whole life, by the way. Long before you woke up this morning. 
Long after you go to sleep tonight, the Spirit of God is circling you with songs of deliverance. He's been circling you since the day you were conceived. And by the way, he's going to circle you until the day that you die. God isn't just for you in a passive sense. God is for you in the most active sense imaginable. The Holy Spirit is praying hard for you. What if you start praying hard as well? Now you got God praying, you got you praying, and that comes together. You want power? Power! Right? Dunamis! Dynamite, dynamic, dunamis, the power of the Lord. Grab hold of the power of the Lord. A few months ago, we talked about the story of Elijah. It's another story about a drought. I want to revisit that this morning because there had been no rain for three years. In other words, there's no puddle jumping. Couldn't jump in a puddle, Kel. Big bummer on. I caught him here sleeping. <laughs> Just mess with you. The Lord then promised Elijah he would send rain. But here's the thing. Like every promise, Elijah needed to pray, and, and, and he had to circle it in our vernacular for this series of, of, with persistent prayer. So Elijah climbs up to the top of Carmel, Mount Carmel, fell on his face, he prayed for rain. And he sent his servant out to the sea to look to see if it was raining. So Elijah is praying, right? He's doing his circle. He's praying. He sends the servant out there, and the servant goes out looking for the signs of rain. The Lord has promised this, and the servant looks, and you know what he saw? Nothing. So Elijah goes, well, I'm going to keep doing it. So it's day two. This is kind of almost like Jericho. Um, so he keeps praying, though, and, and day two, sends the servant out. Servant goes out, looks out on the horizon, and sees nothing. Day three. Day four. Day five, day six, and the servant now, right? Day six, we're looking, nothing, nothing. And that's when most of us give up, right? We've done our effort, we've tried, we give up, we stop praying because we can't see a tangible difference with our natural eyes. So we allow our circumstances to get between us and God instead of putting God between us and our circumstances, right? We let our circumstances get between us God and us instead of putting God between us and our circumstances. Like Tony, though, who said, I will not move from here. <coughs> you know what Elijah did, right? He kept praying. He's kept there. He's held his holy ground. He stood on the promise that God had given him, praying that promise. And I think Elijah would have kept praying if it took 10,000 days. He would have kept going. But he didn't have to because between the sixth and seventh prayer, there was a subtle shift in the atmospheric pressure. He sends his servant out. His servant goes out, scans the horizon, and there, rising from the sea, can you see it? There's a small cloud. There is a cloud. And the rain came. Took prayer. And it begs the question, right? What if you stopped praying after the sixth day? And the obvious answer is that he would have defaulted on the promise and missed the miracle. But Elijah prayed through, hear this, Elijah prayed through and God came through. Elijah prayed through, God came through. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's easy to give up on dreams. It's easy to give up on the miracle that, that's sitting there. It's easy to, to give up on the promise. It's easy to do those things, to give up on those things. We lose heart. We lose patience. We lose faith. And like a slow leak, it often happens like a tire, right? Y'all been in, in, in the car, you're driving down the road, and all of a sudden it starts going, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, and you go, oh, just let me make it home. I don't want to get out. It's raining. <laughs> But it's a flat. We get a flat. We get a flat tire in our prayer life, right? And, and, and it's just, oh, it's overwhelming. And I, I understand this because I recently had stopped circling a miracle that I've been asking for for most of my life. See, I have this negative stuff that, that likes to beat on me and, and, and this negative uh, self-destructive stuff that goes on in my head. I once believed that God would take those negative voices away. But I got tired of asking, you know, it felt like God had put me on hold, so I decided to hang up. It's like, if you ain't going to answer it, then fine, I quit. You know, I'm doing it. I guess it's my lot in life. This is my, what, what is it, the thorn in the flesh. I said, you know, I'd grab hold of that scripture and say, well, this is just what it's going to be for me. But I recently had a conversation with a friend who reactivated my faith and reminded me that God, I preach this stuff every week, right? It reminded me that God is for me. Two. 
I know God's for you, but, but, but God's for me too, you know? And, and God wants good for me. And God wants me to experience the freedom that comes. And, and I've grabbed hold of it. I've grabbed hold of it again now. I've had a couple of days where there wasn't none of that junk going on. I don't love that. You know, it's not every day yet. But I ain't giving up. Because there's a cloud on the horizon. Rising from the sea. And it's coming. The storm is coming. The rain clouds are coming. Is there some dream of yours that God wants to resurrect? Is there some promise that you need to reclaim? Is there a miracle that you need to start believing in again? God is for you. God is for you. The reason that many of us give up too soon is because we feel like we failed. We feel like we failed if God doesn't answer in our time. But Mike pointed out earlier, and he's dead on, is the only way to fail is if we stop praying. Don't stop praying. Don't give up. Right, Barry? Right, Amy? Keep praying. Get more people to pray. <laughs> you know? Spread the word. Pray. By the way, if you want to pray, join me in praying about this stuff that goes on in my head, feel free. <laughs> I'm for it. <laughs> Even after three years of drought, about a bout of depression, Elijah believed that God could send rain. <clears throat> Even now. And I can't help but wonder if the honey of the circle maker... Uh, guy was inspired by the story of Elijah who prayed for rain seven times. And I wonder if his honey's persistence in prayer was linked to that miracle, right? If God did it for Elijah, he can do it for me. And I wonder if Elijah, by the same token, if his persistence in prayer might be linked to the miracle of the raining quail. If God can send a quail storm, he can certainly send a thunderstorm, right? One thing is certain, though, our most powerful prayers are linked to the promises of God. Our most powerful prayers are linked to the promises of God. When you know that you're praying the promises of God, you can pray with a holy assurance and a holy confidence. You're praying his word. It's the difference between praying on thin ice. It's like me going, hey, I want a Lamborghini. You know, Lord, please give me a Lamborghini or a Porsche or whatever, you know, or, or something. Now, he might, and I'm not saying don't pray for that. I'm saying that's not praying into the promises of God. <laughs> You know, he'll, pro he'll provide for you, but he might not provide that for you. But it's the difference between praying on thin ice and praying on solid ground. When you're praying the promise of God, you're praying on solid ground. You're praying the things that God has said. It's the difference between praying tentatively and praying tenaciously. You can grab hold of the promises of God. You can pray those things. You know, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I heal their land. That's what we're talking about. That's a promise. He's going to do that. You don't have to second guess yourself if it's a promise of God. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken to us by the glory of God. Yes in Christ. Amen. By the glory of God. God promised Joshua. God promised Joshua that he would give him every place he set his foot. But I want to point out a little addendum in that. Because he said this as well, just as I promised Moses. Joshua, I'm going to give you this just as I promised Moses. The promise was originally given to Moses. Then it was transferred to Joshua. In much the same way, God's promises have been transferred to us via Jesus. And hear this. This is critically, critically important. So I'll slay I know I talk fast. So I'm going to say it a little slower. These promises must be interpreted intelligently and applied accurately. But while that is true, it must be interpreted intelligently and applied accurately. There are moments when the Spirit of God is going to quicken your spirit and a promise of God is going to become real in your life. It's going to become yours. It might be that Jeremiah 29, 11. Well, I know the plans I have. It might be something else. Grab hold. Grab hold. We have to be careful not to blindly claim promises that aren't ours. But our greatest challenge is that we don't circle promises we could or should circle. By most conservative estimates, there are more than 3,000 promises in Scripture. 3,000 promises. By virtue of Jesus and what he did on the cross, we have access to those. So the question is, how many of them have you circled? How many of them are real in your life? How many of them have you grabbed hold of? 
I want to share something that I, I think has the power to revolutionize the way that you, that, that, that you pray and the way that you read the Bible. See, we often view prayer as over here and scripture as over here, right? They're two distinct dis disciplines that don't overlap. That's not accurate. What if they're meant to be linked? What if reading became a form of praying and praying became a form of reading? One of the primary reasons we don't pray through is because we can run out of things to say, right? Our lack of persistence is, becomes our lack of conversation pieces. It's kind of like an awkward conversation with God. We don't know what to say, so we run out of things to talk about. And our prayers become a bunch of unused or, or overused and misapplied, misused cliches. So instead of praying hard about a big dream, we end up with small talk. So instead of praying that way, what if we pray through the Bible? What if we change the way that we read the Bible? In fact, the Bible wasn't meant to be read through. What if it was meant to be prayed through? And if you pray through it, you're not going to ever run out of promises to circle because Scripture speaks to us at the place that we are now, not just the place that we are then. The Bible is a promise book. The Bible is a prayer book. And reading is reactive, but prayer is proactive. So reading is the way you get through the Bible, but prayer is the way you get the Bible through you. I want the Bible through me. I want that. As you pray, the Holy Spirit will speak in your spirit and will speak to you. And I can't tell you what, when, how, where, what promises are going to happen, but I can promise you that God will move in the midst of that. And those promises that become your promises, you need to circle those both figuratively and literally in scripture. What if you never read the Bible without a pen? Or, and I know a lot of us have, uh, our Bible is now on our phone and electronic. There, I know this, there's a highlight function. What if you highlighted the promises of God? And what if you circled those promises in prayer? I want to tell you, as we're getting close to the end, I, I want to tell you about Grove Youth Day School. See, Corey Rumbaugh had a dream and a vision for a preschool that helped children to become, grow to be who God created them to be. Oh, wow, grow to be you. That's where that name came from. Who knew? Grow to be who God created you to be. Want that more than just the, you know, putting them through a standardized curriculum or a standardized process and want them to become who God created them to be. And there is a, by the way, there is a curriculum and there is a process. <laughs> Those are important. But our primary thing is to help those children to grow to be who God has made them to be. And that process has created challenges along the way. See, Corey has tenaciously held on to the vision that God gave to her. And that has meant that sometimes she doesn't get paid. Because she sacrifices her salary in order to make sure that the school is okay. It has meant more time spent and money spent that makes sense for that makes sense for a family with three growing boys. It's meant relying on God so much that it hurts sometimes. And we now have nine kids with five full full time paying children. We need another one to kind of hit our 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 our, our, uh, our bottom line. But the dream is bigger. See, Corey continues in the circle that she's drawn to call out to God. Thank you for the drizzle, but I'm praying for it. It's funny when I sent, because I asked Corey if I could use this. I sent that to her and, and she read that and she said, well, actually that was my prayer this morning. I prayed, you know, thank you God for the drizzle that we have nine kids, but, but send a storm. I want, I want a downpour. And, and so that's what the prayer is. So we want to release a rainstorm for Grow to Be You. So we don't have to be week to week in our finances so that we can, we can put together. You know, so we're going to do some things over the course of the summer to help to, to have that base so that everyone can be paid and the school can, can expand because we want to expand in the fall of five days. And we can fulfill the vision that God has given to Corey. This is a God vision. This is not, a, not just a Corey thing. This is God's plan. And for us, be you for him, grow to be you, is who we are at Arbor Point Church. So grab hold of that. Be a prayer for that. What dream has God given to you. Because God has given you a dream. And if he hadn't given you a dream, then he will start seeking him because you're going to get this, get a dream. What's your Jericho? What's your Jericho? Maybe you gave up on it as life moved forward and took you new directions. Maybe it's time to re-engage or engage for the first time. What is your Jericho? What is it that you're going to march around with persistence and endurance and patience and yell at it to the walls to fall down? Bold prayers honor God and God honors 
bold prayers. When you're praying into the will of God, I'm not talking about random I want prayers. I'm talking about praying the promises of God. If you're praying the promises of God, be bold and be tenacious because you're always one prayer away. One prayer away from a miracle. One prayer away from a miracle. In recovery vernacular, don't quit five minutes before your miracle happens. Don't give up. Grab hold. Be bold. Amen.